the challenge of making something with all of these locks. Like, I have no idea what the theoretical maximum is. I suspect we're gonna see someone like Matt Lown flying to Elu with this tech level. In this Kerbal Space Program 2 video, I will be answering the question, how far can you go without unlocking anything? Hello everyone, Karnasa here, and the answer might just surprise you if you have the patience to fly something like this. Help me. For the purpose of this video, I created a new exploration mode save and went straight into R&D and did nothing. Everything flown over the course of this video will be limited to starting node parts, and that gives me one Kerbal-sized can of Heinz beans, one swivel boy dug up from a nearby sewer, one pointless piece of one slightly less pointless piece of one rocket break aparter, a wing that skipped wing day, and one thing I'll forget. Sugar, spice, and everything nice. These were the ingredients chosen to create the perfect little rocket, but Karnasa accidentally added an extra ingredient. Wait, no, I didn't, and that's Powerpuff Girls. Limited to these seven parts will be fun. Anyway, let's build a rocket. This rocket is one of the rockets of all time, nearly encroaching upon untitled spacecraft territory with just how ludicrous it is. Right now I'm performing the finishing touches, which is of course to add wing. Wouldn't want this thing being aerodynamically unstable. With 37 swivel engines on the first stage, I'm fairly sure I have enough gimbal to keep this controlled if I could fly this at more than a frame per second. The initial design was a complete success in nuking the Kerbal space program. Clearly more design work was needed, so I came back in to the vehicle assembly building and moved things apart, like so. And more moving, move it even more. Yes, movement, more movement. I love movement. Look at all of that movement. So many things being moved right now. I love movement. Have you ever seen? Back on the launch pad now, and the rocket aptly named the F*** Me I'm Going Home is no longer shaking like Michael J. Fox. Moving apart the tanks meant that they had no chance of clipping into each other, which I'm fairly sure is where the instability came from. I did have a slight problem with this launch vehicle though, in that it was getting less than one frame per second. Having 37 engines on the first stage will do that to you in Kerbal Space Program 2. This is being done in the For Science update, obviously because I'm using the tech tree, where there have been a slew of performance fixes, and trust me, if I was trying this mission at release, I would not even get it onto the launch pad. The game would almost certainly crash before I even got that far. So this video is called How Far Can You Go With No Science In KSB2, and I've not even spoken about where I'm going to be taking this ridiculous shaped noodly pencil rocket. Well, at least it's not noodly anymore, thanks to the wobble fix from KSP2 for science. We, if you haven't guessed it from the thumbnail, are getting going to Tylo. One of the moons of Jewel is the hardest celestial body to land in the game. You need more rocket juice to land there than anywhere else. The only mission that requires more Delta V is an Eve return, and that is something I didn't quite fancy trying with this tech level, considering I don't have heat shields. This first iteration was more than capable of getting into space though, and I say first iteration because this isn't going to be the only design on this video. This is just going to be a Tylo land. That's going to be hard enough, requiring over 9,000 meters per second of delta V. But by the end of the video, I have grander plans. The maneuver to Jewel all plotted out and completed with the second from last stage. Now it was just a case of fine-tuning my orbit so that I would be in a nice inclination when I arrive. I don't want to be going completely the wrong way and missing Tylo and flying off into the deep void of space. Stranding Tim C. Kerman, who is the Kerbal on board this mission, we wouldn't want to leave anyone behind over the course of this video. I really hope no one told him that there wasn't enough fuel for him to return to Kerbin from the surface of Tylo. I mean, does it really matter? Do his loved ones care? Actually, they probably do. But if this was Jebediah, would his loved ones care? No, because he doesn't have any. He's a sad, lonely Kerbal that even Valentina doesn't like anymore. I swear in KSP2, Jeb has been made this complete idiot. If you follow the storyline, he gets rather angry and threatens people with faulty coffee makers. A little bit different from the brave, daring Kerbal we had in Kerbal Space Program 1 who would go on all adventures and inevitably end up getting stuck in every single washing machine he could find on his grand journeys out into the deep spaces of the Kerbola system. Wait, no, that might have just been that video I saw on Kerbub. Anyway, weird tangent aside, we are now at Jewel. And now for some lesser known facts about Jewel. Jewel is the greenest place in the entire Kerbal system, aside from Jeb's hairy 
Jewel is so big, it's wider than your mum's girth after a three month diet. Jewel will sometimes whisper to you at night, but only if you dial 555-555555 before going to sleep and throwing your phone at a toaster. Jewel is okay, that's enough fun facts about Jewel. We're not here for Jewel, we're here for Tylo. I mean, just look at that lovely rock, wouldn't you want to step all over it and explore it, sir? And yes, we've broken the spacecraft apart in preparation for the final stages of this mission, where we are going to attempt to slam into the surface going rather slowly, so we don't kill Tim. It would be a bit of a useless lander if it broke apart when we landed. After finagling with the manoeuvre tool for quite some time, I got an encounter with Tylo that I was quite happy with. And then it was just to perform a slowdown burn once we reached the moon. And, you know, bring ourselves into a bit of a lower orbit, because it's much easier to pick a landing site if you are in a nice, low, circular orbit. And there is absolutely no way I'm going to make this any more difficult than it already is using only starting part tech to try and land on the hard hardest body to land on in the game. That would be rather silly. There are already enough limitations at play in this video. I don't get a nice circular orbit when I first arrive at the moon, but a juicy little squeeze of the throttle is more than capable of putting this into its desired location about 120 kilometers off the surface. The stage I am using to land, the long pencil stage, does have a thrust to weight ratio of about two in Tylo orbit. That should be more than capable of landing me on the surface. I would like to say I performed this first try, but we all know that's false. There we go, we have touched down, and a quick EVA to avoid a crushing doom. Tim gets out, plants a flag, but now this does make me wonder, can I come up with a design that is able to return Tim home? So it's back to the vehicle assembly building to try and design something that will be able to return successfully to the surface of Kerbin from the surface of Tylo. My calculations for this, and these may be completely wrong because I am bad at maths, I will need about 15,000 meters per second of delta V. This may seem like an abnormally high number for a Tylo return mission, but there is a reason for that, and that is I do not have heat shields. This means I am not going to be able to aerobrake at Kerbin. I need to propulsively capture on my way back, which makes this mission a lot more expensive Delta V wise. To get over the slight inconvenience of tipping over and destroying the capsule when landing on the surface of Tylo, I made the base of the Tylo lander section much wider. Due to the lamentable fact of the cruel thing known as the rocket equation, to get back from the surface of Tylo, this thing is going to be so much larger than the previous design. That means in the VAB right now, I'm just going to be stacking these on top of each other, so I hope you don't mind if I skip ahead a bit. I lost count of the parts at about stage 2, but I do know this, there are now 200, or there will be 211 swivel engines on the first stage. Considering I was getting less than a frame per second with only 37 of those engines, I was going to be in for a fun time. That is, if the game actually let me launch this. I tried about 6 times, every time the game either froze or crashed, so instead we'll have a dancing rocket breakdown. Looking about as stable as me, the last time I was in XOYO, these designs really weren't going to cut the mustard. But luckily, with a bit more movement, I think I can make this work. Rather than just sending the one mission to Tylo, the new plan was to send two, an orbiter and a lander. But only having first node technology meant that I would have to do some funky rendezvous shenanigans. This vessel here, now with 57 engines on the first stage, was even slower to launch than the first successful design. Seriously, I don't know why I do this to myself sometimes. This took about an hour and a half from launch to get into low Kerbin orbit. It was so incredibly painful. I was on voice chat when I the entire time and he was just about keeping me sane whilst I watched this crawl at sub one frame per second. It did get much better when I removed the first stage but still not very fun to fly. I'm not sure if it would be feasibly possible to fly anything larger than this without a hardware upgrade. So right now this is my limitation, my PC, not what I can come up with. Having already landed on Tylo once this video, this is going to be the next lander. I mean, what's the point in sending an orbiter if I don't know I can successfully land on the surface? I did design this with much more delta V than the first pencil rocket design, and it does have a much wider base in order to try and land the right way up. 
Anyway, Orbit achieved, now it was time to go to Jewel, and something about the protractor of Jewel being in line with the angle of the greatest slice of cheese? I've got no idea. Well, no, it's supposed to be 90 degrees from Kerbin, which I did do and got a very efficient transfer. I am really missing the transfer window planner. That is something that is invaluable for going into planetary and something I would really like to see make a comeback. Like, I can do it without, as I have just demonstrated, it would sure make launching at the exact right time a lot less stressful. But despite all of that, the encounter with Jewel has been set up with Mark II of the first node technology rocket. And look at it as it soars gracefully like a flying duck with its wings clipped away from Kerbin. It is one of the most unique designs I think I have ever come up with. It does look rather... <laughs> <laughs> Rather odd, but yes, I needed to make the landing legs be tanks because I didn't have any, because I don't have access to any landing legs, so we had to make do. Hopefully those tanks don't bend and buckle under pressure, because that would be very disastrous for poor Jebediah Kerman on board. Yes, this time we do have Jebediah, and he's looking a little bit odd these days. I didn't know this until recently, but the model for Jebediah Kerman in KSP2 has different sized eyes. If you look at him, his left eye is a lot smaller than his right one, and it is rather unnerving. Jeb, what happened to you? Like, my man, come on. What have you done in the 10 years since KSP1 and KSP2? Gone for some sort of botched laser eye surgery that sliced half of his eye off? That's, that's almost horrific, that. <laughs> KSP2, next horror game. <laughs> Lethal Company, eat your heart out. Now's probably a good time to talk about the KSP2 giveaway competition that I've got going on, and if you want to know how you can enter that competition, go check out my video from earlier on this week. I'll put a card to it now, but I have three copies of the game to give away, and I'm going to be announcing the winners on a live stream that I'm doing tomorrow. I wanted it to be completely random, completely fair, so I'm going to be doing a raffle on stream, and I'll see who gets those copies. Perfect time to come back now for the Tylo landing, with 1,743 meters per second of Delta V left in the tanks. Unfortunately, this is not going to be able to get back into Tylo orbit. Or will it? There is a way, but we'll get to that momentarily. For now, I have got Jebediah out on the surface, gathering all the science he can. If I am able to successfully return this trip, that's 2,400 science from the first launch, which is quite a lot. I'm not entirely sure, but you might be able to complete the first two tiers of the tech tree with that much science, but I would highly recommend not doing that this way, honestly. Please don't do that to yourself. This has been so painful. And even trying to get poor Jebediah back onto the space craft with no ladder on Tylo. Oh, it's, it's a travesty. Look at him. We did eventually manage to get back in. And I think that's only because his jetpack was running out of fuel. But speaking of jetpacks running out of fuel, yes, that's exactly how I'm going to be getting to orbit of Tylo with only 1,750 meters per second of Delta V left in the spacecraft that is landed on there. So Tylo, you need about 2,250, but I like to go for about two and a half thousand. With the 600 meters per second of Delta V that the EVA jetpack provides, I should have about 2,350 meters per second of Delta V. Between Jebediah and the spacecraft. Definitely not taking any inspiration from For All Mankind or the Martian here, Jebediah exits the capsule and powers up his RCS backpack. This was rather terrifying because if I didn't have enough, then Jeb would become a permanent green stain, a new fixture on the largest moon in the Kerbola system. Really, I would rather avoid that happening. The game seems to give Jeb enough hate already. I'm sure he would be forced to clean up his own space flat on that moon if he was able to, but he wouldn't be able to because, well, he wouldn't have any arms or a face or hands or ears. I don't know what ears would do to help him in that situation. They might, you never know. Anyway, with the smallest fraction of monopropellant left over, maybe not even enough to grab onto a passing spaceship, Jeb has made it back into orbit of Tylo, and that, and that means I now need to design the second craft to come and pick him up. A craft that won't need to be as large as the previous one, because 
because landing on Tylo takes up four and a half thousand meters per second of Delta V, so it can get away with being a little bit smaller. And here we have it firing up on the launch pad, but it is still incredibly slow because there are still a lot of engines on the first stage. Now I'm going to save this mission for a future video because if I'm honest, this flight failed and I was running out of time to finish this to get this video out this week. There are a few edits I need to make in order to be able to pick up Jeb from Tylo orbit. But to answer the question of this episode, how far can you go with no science in KSB2? Well, a Tylo lander and return is possible. You just need to send a couple of missions at once. It does beg the question though, and an idea for a future video. Could you complete the entire primary storyline of exploration mode in one single launch? Thinking about it, no, because you do need probes, but maybe a better plan would be, can you land on the moon, Minmus and Juno all in one mission and finally end up landed on Tylo at the end? You don't need to return to complete the primary storyline, you just need to land at the Tylo monument. I think that might be an interesting challenge and definitely something that I might do at a future date. A big thanks to Y Mandarin, Darth Malakor, Mr. Blue Star, Ryan Miller and the rest of my patrons and members for their continued support. I have been Karnassa and I will see you later.